Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Well, my, to my name is Todd Ferrante, um, and what I wanted to do is talk to you about how to use CAD to design your um, actuators. And uh, the way that this sort of came about was um, earlier this year, we were using um, a, uh, a gear motor driven by uh, uh, sprockets in the chain to raise and lower our pickup arm. And at our first regional, we found that that was not working out very well for us. Um, <coughs> we had uh, too much play in the mechanical components that were in there. Um, and our uh, potentiometer that we had on there sensing our down position um, was going into the, the analog to digital converter, which has like 128 different uh, uh, levels. Mm -hmm. yeah. And between the mechanical play and the coarse resolution on the ADD converter, we were not able to set the position where it needed to be on the floor so that we could consistently pick up the frisbees. Either it would drive too far and um, it would cause the motors to slip, or it wouldn't go down far enough and we couldn't get underneath the, the frisbees reliably. Um, so at the end of the day on, I think it was on Friday, um, we ended up deciding that we wanted to switch over to air cylinders to actuate that arm. Um, and in the wee hours of Friday night, we grabbed our CAD student and, well, student at the time, and huddled in a hotel room and went through very quickly a design for ripping off that gear motor and chain and replacing it with that cylinder with the cylinder that we happened to have on hand. Um, and when we did that, um, I said, hey, that was pretty cool what we just did. We ought to present that. So this is what we ended up with. Was was the cylinder we talked here? Um, so over the course of the summer, we decided that we wanted to improve on that arm because uh, one of our goals was to be able to pick up two frisbees side by side, and that one with the funnel on it was jamming up the frisbees when we tried to pick it up. So we ended up ripping that arm off and making a new arm that was wider, and in the course of that we needed to do an actuator. So I figured I'd use that as a case study to, to make this presentation up. Um, so, what I wanted to show you is once you've got your robot model, and, uh, and, and this can even be done for you guys that are doing 2D, this could be done in 2D as well. It doesn't have to be done in 3D. Um, you need to find out what your limits of motion are. In this particular case, we wanted this arm to come down here so that this roller was sitting on the floor. So that was at zero degrees. And then when the arm goes up, the arm they needed to be within the frame parameter. Perimeter. So that was at 119 degrees. Yes. Okay. So that's at 119 degrees. Um, and you want to write those numbers down because this is an iterative process and it involves putting the arm up and down a lot in your software. Um, the next thing that you do is you just pick a couple hypothetical anchor points for your cylinder where somewhere near where you think they might might work out to be. Um, in this particular case, I think there's one right here, and that was chosen because that happened to be where the anchor point was with, with the previous cylinder. Um, and then we picked a point out here um, just because it looked good. <laughs> Sometimes you can you can pick maybe this corner that's right here because it's easy to pick um, and measure between because what you're going to be doing is measuring between there we go measuring between these two points to find out what's the length when it's up, what's the length when it's down. So in this particular case, there you go. So first thing you do is measure between. Measure when it's down, measure when it's up. You've got a, a, a distance here, distance here. That tells you what your stroke is going to be. Once you've got a first guess at what your stroke might be, 
you want to compare that to what you've either got with you or what you can easily buy. Um, these are double acting cylinders from McMaster Car. We use those because number one, they always have them in stock. And number two, when you order them on a credit card, the McMaster fulfillment depots or warehouses are close enough that you can get them the next day without paying any extra. Um, so, in this particular case, and you probably can't read any of those numbers, but um, you go in here and you find that a 12 inch long cylinder, it has a certain particular overall, a 12 inch stroke cylinder has a particular overall dimension. Um, you don't want to forget that cylinders always have clevis on the front, depending on how they're mounted, when the, the, the uh, dimensions that are given to you in the catalog are just the overall length with no clevis on. Um, so this number that's here in the table is when it's closed, you have to add on the stroke length and then add on the, uh, the extra clevis. So in this case, yeah. here, it says 16.62. Okay. So you come back and you compare what that dimension was, that overall extended length, to what you've actually got room for. Um, and now, if it fits in there, and you, you picked your points the, right the first time, great, you got lucky. Um, oftentimes you don't, or even if you do get lucky and you can find an off-the-shelf cylinder um, that will fit, often by manipulating these points, and sometimes very slightly, you can drastically reduce the amount of stroke that you need. So. I can page up a couple of times. So from the first points that I picked here and here, we needed a cylinder that was, and the cylinders come in increments of certain numbers of inches. This, this required greater than 12 inches. And you'll notice that, for instance here, we jump from 12 to 17. 17. 17. Yeah. <laughs> you don't want to be over 12. You might be one, a little bit over 10, bump up to 12, but you don't want to be over 12 because you have to go to a huge cylinder. So you can tweak your positions of your of your mounting points. In this particular case, lowered this one, took it from up here down to here, and before I think this one was out here a little bit, moved it back and got it down to something that now that might take was over six, and so that would mean we'd have to use like an eight-inch stroke cylinder. Um, it's considerably less heavy than the flow. Um, the weight doesn't make that much of a difference because it's, the thing that's changing together, is that, that thin real thin wall, wall yeah. and the, the, just the steel, the length of the steel shaft. Um, it's really more about fitting in space and what well, the thing that really makes a difference is how much air it's going to take. Um, what would be the say the difference between, say, the examples there where you're going from that larger requirement to the smaller requirement, you, you cut it, how much would the air per stroke be? Well, if, if, well, let's say we had to go, we were going to have to use, what, a 17-inch yeah. stroke cylinder down to an 8-inch stroke cylinder, so yeah, half, yeah. half the air. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's by moving those positions really very slightly. They're not that far from where they were originally. Okay. Um, unfortunately, what moving those positions around will often do is, uh, I think the original, the first one was A up here, and now it's down here. Um, if you notice that if you extend this line straight out, the distance between that line and your pivot point is very close now. So you're going to need a lot of force. Mm -hmm to so overcome whatever it is that's holding in place. Whereas way up here, you probably had, you probably did a third of the force. Um, so you need more pressure. Well, what you do is, it's it another, another thing on this table up here. Um, these these cylinders more. are all rated. You can choose the diameters okay. based on the amount of force that you need. Uh, so this one, these ones all give you 35. This one's 61. This is 105. That's so based on your size. That's yeah, right, and that's based on 100, 100 psi supply pressure. If you drop down to the 60 that we're allowed to use, 
these are your new numbers. Yeah. Now, usually, for first, for first stuff, when you're just trying to actuate things, you're not going to need 63 pounds to, to do something, unless you're, you, unless you're really close to your pivot point. But if you're really close to your pivot point, the forces that you're putting into those linkages are pretty high, and you just don't want to load up your parts that high. Usually, you can, you can choose a point where you're going to have low force. Uh, another trick that we, we have learned to use a lot is uh, if you look at the original picture of the robot, the lever arm, we use counterbalance springs. Yeah. So we'll use a, a very small cylinder. Um, in this case, this was this one was the one that gave, what was it, 30? And then you drop that down to 20? Yeah. But because we've got this spring on here, when this thing is down, we, can, we put just the right amount of tension on there so that this is counterbalancing the weight of this arm so that the, the actual force on this, on this um, cylinder, when it's extended, is almost nothing. If this is disconnected, this thing will just barely sit on the floor. You can just pump it up a little bit and man, it'll come right on it. So, so it didn't take so, so much can, to close it. That's right. You use your counterbalance springs to make it so that your cylinders don't have to be very strong. <laughs> Generally, in this case, um, if, you're, if you're trying to decide where to put your counterbalance spring, in this case you're going to want it, uh, let's say, stretched and, and providing force when this is down because that's all the weight of the arm is hanging out here. <coughs> Once it's up, you don't have so much force to extend it because your CG of this arm is pretty much a little bit to the right of your uh, of your pivot point, but not so much. Uh, there we go. Now I have step 5A, which is iterate again. B, iterate again. You want to do this a number of times, and what you'll find out is there is going to be a pretty decent position where um, you want to make this, so, so this one, I, I move the pivot point up a little bit to increase the amount of uh, torque that I'm going to get um, in that up position. And this is just under the 8-inch stroke. Which is almost perfect. Which is just about perfect. If, uh, if, if originally, what was it, like 6 and 3 quarters or so? Mm -hmm. So this thing was down a lot further, and uh, I was kind of, I had stroke that I wasn't using. I wasn't getting the benefit of it. Um, so, and, and really the, 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 the black art is deciding how to do this iteration so that you end up with the final design that is happy. And there's not really any steps that you can tell anybody to do to do that. You just have to experiment and play with them. Um, now, you'll notice that all of that, all of this stuff was done with no geometry in there. This is all using um, data maxis which all solid models will have, uh, solid modeling software will have, if you're doing it with 2D software, you know, with X's on crosses or whatever it is. Um, once you have um, the stroke worked out and you think that you know which cylinder you want to use, go to McMaster Car, you download the assembly model for this cylinder, it's right there, import it into uh, your solid modeling software, get the one for the clevis, download that too, and what I do is I'll have, I've got an axis here, I've got an axis up on the front side. Build yourself a datum plane that connects those two. And then put another vertical datum plane in here where you think the cylinder is going to be in space. And with those two datum planes and these two axes, you can assemble the cylinder body anchored to this axis assemble the clevis anchored to this axis with both of those lined up on that data plane and then take your cylinder plunger and assemble it onto your clevis lined up the same way. Now it's in where you want it to be and when you put the arm up and down it'll go, it'll follow the geometry that you're looking for. And once you've got that in place, now you can use the, uh, the cylinder in those different um, positions to design your mounting brackets. And this one now has a cutout and a mounting hole. 
And one thing you don't want to forget is go and check for interferences on both sides with the rest of your system to see if you're going to hit anything. Um, and that's that. That right there is why using 3D solid modeling software is nice. It's because as long as it's modeled, then you'll find those interferences. Um, if there is stuff in your robot that's not modeled, then you'll find out. <laughs> you'll find out when you put it in hardware and it's stuff. Um, you want to check on both both of your uh, limits of motion. You also want to check your mid stroke. Um, let's go back to the side view. So you'll see in this particular case in, in that um, the cylinder is down low when it's in the up position. When this goes up and over, as this um, this the line between these goes up and over the top, the cylinder will go up and come back down again. If you just check your end positions, you may find that when this goes up, it'll hit something that's up here. So you want to check a couple, want, at least check the midpoint. That should keep you in if there's something wrong, but you may want to check a couple other points in the middle too. Um, some modeling software um, will allow you to just grab, uh, if you release some of the constraints, you can just grab the end of this and drag it up and down and the, the linkage will go with it. That's another way that you can check for interferences. So, results. So we ended up with uh, a cylinder connecting the backside up to here. You can see it here as well. Um, here's an arm we stuck on there with the counterbalance spring. And it worked out really well. Um, I should should say that the first time we did this, we used one of the cylinders that we had in the shop, which was pretty small. And it turned out that it worked great at picking the arm up off the floor because we had the right counterbalance spring in. But when we found out that when the arm was up, the CG was over just enough so that when you gave it full force, it had to call it pressurize that cylinder. So it took five to 10 seconds for it to push it over. So we said, well, it would get there eventually, but let's just buy the next larger cylinder size up. Um, I think that, that next larger cylinder size up gave twice as much force. It was quarter inch or half an inch longer, so it still fit. And that way, you're not living on the ragged edge of whether or not it's going to work. So we pulled out the old one, put the new one in. I think, I don't even know if it required a redesign of the bracket that was on there. Ran went right in, and you just adjust the length of your, of your clevis to see if it's going to work. And it worked great. Uh, any questions? So instead of picking points, you could have you could have used arcs and figured out where the arcs intersect. Is what? You could have you could have picked one point, uh, mm -hmm. either, either end, mounting point, and then uh, mm -hmm. and then just trace circles to figure out where you could. The, where the circles intersect. Yeah, you could. Um, to do that, you'd have to. It's much easier to do that if you're working in two D yeah, software. Sure. In three D software, it's not so easy to make a make a, a, an arc. Yeah. You'd have to go into a, like a sketch mode and right. sketch something from the side. Yeah. Okay. Oh, thank you. Yeah.